we finally reached the actual um, end of our logistical path for natural gas from wellhead to burner tip, we're going to talk about the various types of end users. This is not an all-inclusive list, but we'll cover um, quite a few of them. We've got uh, basically local distribution companies, which uh, I've referred to thus far as gas companies. That's what they are, and then the various direct end users of natural gas. Local distribution companies, otherwise in the business known as LDCs, these are your gas companies. Whoever your local gas uh, company is, is an LDC. They're going to distribute the gas to the various end users that are connected to their systems. Um, their primary operation is to is distribute low pressure gas. When we talked about transmission pipelines, they move the gas at very, very high pressures. And you can't have that type of pressure coming into your house, especially uh, into something like a uh, hot water heater. Um, so they lower the pressure. You can see here uh, mainline transmission pipelines can be running 500 pounds per square inch to as much as uh, 1,500 pounds per square inch. Well, the gas flow into your house at the meter needs to be cut down to 4 to 6 ounces per square inch. So we have residential customers, commercial customers, industrial and electric customers. Another type of operation, they can actually perform a transportation service. In other words, several states across the country uh, have what's known as a deregulated natural gas industry and that includes deregulation of the local distribution companies so if you're a large enough end user you actually can buy gas from a uh, an entity other than the natural gas company your local gas company uh, but they still make sure that it gets delivered to you and so they charge you a transportation fee so we refer to this as transportation behind the city gate that means within the distribution territory um, so end users can have their own transportation on the LDC's system. Uh, it's an open access system. So in other words, um, any entity that qualifies under their regulations to do so can, in fact, buy from someone else and have it transported. Here's kind of a breakdown of that delivered price. When you get that gas bill and you look at it, these are the components. You've got the commodity is only 34% uh, percent of that, so the price of the commodity itself. The LDC or the pipeline company, um, you know, there's, a, there's about 19% there of the cost has to do with the transmission pipeline transportation and storage, uh, but then the distribution costs are 47%. So this is your gas company providing that service. Here's just a typical residential meter. And here we just have a large metropolitan area. This happens to be Denver, so we're going to address the actual end users. You can just see here some of the end users. Uh, electric power is the largest end user for natural gas at 31%, followed by industrials and then residentials. Commercials having a very small percentage as well. And one thing here, notice the um, vehicle fuel at this point in time, as of 2013, was only was less than 1% of the consumption of natural gas in the US. We'll talk about electric generators. These, uh, There's two different groups. You've got the electric utility generators. These are regulated producers of electricity. They're either federally regulated or they're regulated by the respective states. And then you have the non-utility electric generators, the so-called independent power producers. These are also known as merchant power companies. And then another group is known as the co-generators. These are, these are companies whose uh, plants actually produce electricity and steam, steam as an actual commercial commodity. Um, it can be shipped uh, by pipeline to nearby facilities such as food processing or actual um, crude oil refineries. Within electric generation, we have different types of uh, generators themselves. A simple cycle generator uh, has gas turbines. These are essentially jet engines. They're internal combustion. They use natural gas as a fuel. Uh, and then there's also steam turbines where the natural gas goes into a boiler first and create steam and the steam is used to push the turbines. It's not the fuel source, it's literally uh, spinning the turbines. You also have combined cycle plants. This is where you have a combination of gas and steam turbines. The gas turbine, again, is strictly using natural gas as a fuel, but it, ge it has exhaust heat. That exhaust heat then is pumped into a boiler where it creates steam, which then drives a steam turbine. So combined cycle natural gas plants are among your most efficient. And then again, we have the cogeneration uh, facilities where they've got a, a gas turbine, which is going to you know, create electricity, but then also have a steam boiler uh, where they're going to create the steam, as I mentioned, to sell as an actual commercial commodity. 
And then you can see here, this is somewhat of a, a simplified diagram of the process itself. Um, now you see on the left, you have an energy supply or fuel. Now the fuel, in this case, doesn't matter. It can be coal, uh, it can be wood, it can be natural gas, it can be um, nuclear uh, fission. It's anything that can create heat. Because the idea here is to take water and basically uh, bring it to you know a, a boiling point where you have steam. Now the steam actually drives the turbine. Uh, that's the um, little blue and white uh, area in the uh, middle part of the diagram uh, in the center there. That turbine spins and on the axle of that turbine are magnets, very large magnets, and they spin within a copper wire field. Uh, the magnets are of opposite polarity and then when they spin they actually create current which as you can see goes on out into the um, transmission lines. And most plants recirculate then the steam. They cool it down. That's what those large cooling towers are that you see. Uh, and then they recycle as much of that water as they can. Here's what a typical gas turbine looks like. Again, you can see it's got fins on it like a jet engine. Um, other end users, such as uh, industrial end users, you've got petrochemical refining, as I mentioned. Uh, they're going to have feedstocks created from natural gas, paper production, uh, metals, especially things like steel mills, use a considerable amount of um, gas in their furnaces. Um, stone, essentially cement plants. Um, they have components like clay and glass and silica and sand. And they actually, in addition to having furnaces, once the um, cement is created, it's in a wet mixture, and they use natural gas to actually dry it. Um, all types of food processing, I'm sure that everyone can come up with to use that. And then in fertilizer, um, uh, anhydrous ammonia or uh, fertilizer, 80% of that feedstock happens to be um, natural gas. And then we also have commercial uses. Believe it or not, there are large air conditioning uh, units at, uh, let's say, for instance, in large warehouses or factories that can run off of natural gas. Um, uh, you know, food service, motels, hotels. Um, healthcare, various um, hospitals, office buildings, and then at the retail level. And then, uh, last but not least, we have natural gas vehicles. Uh, the market for natural gas vehicles has grown in the last few years, but <coughs> excuse me, um, it's probably going to decline because just recently, Honda Motor said they're going to uh, phase out the manufacture of their CNG Civic, which has been around for probably 20 years, and then also their um, Honda Accord CNG vehicle as well. Now, the better ones are dual fuel. You can use gasoline or CNG, but CNG still has an important usage within what we would call fleet vehicles. Um, for instance, metropolitan buses, trucks using, um, you know, on short haul routes like the um, USPS or FedEx or UPS, and then pool cars, various companies who, um, you know, have, let's say, a certain district and uh, they don't need the longer range. Uh, cars they can um, use CNG, but again, the you know the, the limitations are the limited range and refueling. Now the refueling infrastructure across the United States is getting better, um, but for most people it is still um, a sticking point in terms of buying these types of vehicles.